Okay, good evening, everyone. I hope uh, I'm audible and also you are able to uh, listen to me. Yeah, that's good. Fine. Okay, great. So let us start the session once again. Right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to Digital Forensic Essential Series. Uh, today's session, we are going to talk about um, understanding hard disk and file system. That's something which will help you to, um, you know, at the end of the session, you will know how the hard disk and file system works. So what is the objective of session is to make sure at the end of the session, you are able to analyze file system using some of the tools uh, from um, you know, forensic lab. Like for example, we have something called auto spy, and sleuth kit. Okay, these are the two tools you will learn. And interestingly, you will also you will be able to uh, you will be able to see. Can you can you chart now? I think I'm enabled. Probably you'll be able to chart. Yes. We use the chat box. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Good. Okay, so the whole idea of today's session is about now you are getting into digital forensic step by step. The first thing is to analyze or get information from the hard disk. So getting the things from hard disk or storage device is very, very important for us to understand you know, what kind of uh, problem you know, or what kind of evidence we can produce when we go analyze any file systems, okay? So we'll be talking about different type of storage drivers and their characteristic and also the logical structure of a disk, and then understanding the booting process of Windows, Linux, Mac, OS, and what are the different file system of Windows, Linux, and Mac system, and then we will talk about analyzing files. So today we are, the main objective of today's session is to, if you, if somebody deleted a file in the hard disk, somebody, for example, uh, hacked into your system and deleted the file. So will you be able to recover? Will you be able to analyze? That is something which we want to, you know, do it today. Are you able to understand the main objective of today's session? All of you? Yeah. The objective of today's session is to make sure that you have somebody deleted, maybe they hacked into a system or somebody did something uh, which we want to make sure that we can monitor and also we can recover those files. So that is something very, very important. So we are going to talk about a lot of theories and sometimes it will be interesting to you. Uh, maybe sometime it may be boring because this is talking about what is a file system, different type of file system and same way how the system works. But just please follow it up as a theory but when you do lab, you will be able to correlate what we learn. Is that fine? So I know that when you, when you start uh, learning about the file system or, or the structures, it may be more of theoretical. But when you start doing a lab, you will be able to correlate, right? So very good. 
Is the voice is clear? I think I am not sure because everybody is able to hear me. Is there anyone having problems? Sagir, is it uh, clear? Voice? Yeah, everybody is uh, clear. Yeah, okay. Fine. Okay, those who are not clear, please check your mic. Mr. Jack, I'm saying clear. Okay, fine. Very good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fine. So let us start analyzing file system and auto using auto three and Smith kit. There is something at the end of the session we will be learning. Okay. So let us start understanding one by one. So we are going to talk about different type of disk drives and their characteristics. What are the different type of disk drive? Can you just on a quick note, can you type what are the different type of disk drive, you know? Just type in the chat box. SGD, very good. HDD, HDD, very good. That's wonderful. Yeah, flash. You know, ND plus is a file system. We are talking about hard disk. Then we will get into how the booting process work. When you are booting a system, where from it take the data, the OS is loaded. Then we will talk about file system. Some of the file system, can you can you name some of them? Somebody type, you know, for the hard disk, NTFS. It's a file system. What other file system we have? Yeah, only NTFS. Fat. Am I right? X center four. Yeah, yes, four. You're right. Fat thirty two. You know, yes, four. So Mac has a different file system, you're right. So we will be talking about that, you know, what are the different file systems so that you understand how the file system works look like, am I right? Why we need to understand because when you want to recover, please always understand why we are learning this because we are going to recover a file which is deleted. We are going to analyze the hidden file. So this is our exercise. But in order to do that, you should know a little bit of theory. All right, that's why we are trying to explain that. Okay. The logical structure of a disk, very file system in Windows, Linux, and Mac system. So let us get. So understanding the hard disk, I think most of us would have uh, learned about this because this is something which we start always when in our computer. All right, we, I don't want to go much thing, but you need to understand it is a non-volatile storage. It records data magnetically. That is something which is very important, all right? So we also need to understand what is the performance? How do you buy a hard disk? You, you say that it's a high performance hard disk. It's directly proportional to the RPM, revolutions per minute of the drive plate. So, so this is the head, all right? This is the plate. So once you put that, how quickly this can spin, right? So there is a direction for spinning. So how quickly it can spin? That is called you know, revolution per minute. That depends upon the read write performance because you are going to have something as a killer, you know, which is going to write. But at the end of the who decides the data is written? This is the one, not the way. So if it spins up at very high speed, that means you can read the data at read write performance will differ. Is that fine? Yeah. See the performance, you are absolutely right or not. So you have something called tracks. So this is called tracks. It's an entire thing is track, right? The entire thing is called. So you have track one, track two, three. Okay. Then we have something called cluster. So I'm going to keep that as a cluster of data, right? But the more very precious or small one, we call it as what? Sector. Is it good? So we have sector, then it forms cluster, and then a lot of clusters form what? Tracks. So does it make, okay, you are able to understand all of you? Sector, cluster, and tracks. So the, the least place where it, the data is stored is called sector, right? So you have something like power connector to power on the artist because 
artistic care power, then jumper pins to change the setting. And then how do you connect with the motherboard or the backdoor? Am I right? Where we need to connect to the CPU, memory, and all of them. This is based on the SCSI connect. Am I right? So small computer system interface, which connects the entire into the motherboard. So is that clear? Are you able to now anatomy of, uh, of, of your uh, hard disk, am I right? So you have actuators, arms, which is moving. This is the head is the one which is reading. Is it clear all of you are able to understand? Very good. So let us get into the next one. So as I said, it has got tracks. It's a circle on the platers where all the information is stored. Then we have drive head can access the circle ring one position at a time, all right? It cannot move. So it has to be one position. Then tracks are numbered with identification purposes. Read rate is performed by rolling the header from the inner to the outermost part of the disk. So what's going to happen? That means when you are reading, so it's going to from inner to outermost, right? So it's going to start from here, then it's going to go to the outermost. That's how it's going to read. Fine. So track number, we have track number like head zero, head one, head two, head three, head four. So we have multiple things about it. tracks and sectors. We talked about it. So that is, this is a complete called track. And this one element is called track. Right? So track numbering begins at zero, the outer edge. All right? Then it keep on the center, the number of the tracks and the other depends on the size of the disk. So based on the size of this, it varies and differs. The read rate hits on both surfaces of a plater are tightly packed and locked together or something. And then you have something called track number. The arm, when, when we put that arm, it's moves, am I right? Together to physically locate heads at the same track number. So we have head. So a cylinder is a group of tracks that start at the same head position of the disc. So when you call about this, this cylinder, this is a cylinder, am I right? Cylinder one. Then you may have another one, we call it a cylinder two. Okay. So that is how it works, cylinder one, cylinder two. So it starts at the same head position. So this starts at the same head position. So you're able to understand the cylinder. Yeah. Jumper pins, in order to change your setting, somebody, you know, you want to rewrite, maybe you want to send, each artist come with some kind of a jumper pins to, you know, reset maybe. So there could be a lot of things which can be done, but generally you need to understand that jumper pin is used for such kind of purpose. Okay. Is it clear? So what is sector? Sector is the one we told where the data is stored. Farid, are you able to understand what is jum jumper pins? Yeah. So let us get into what is sector, which is we, we said it is where a smallest portion, right? Is the smallest physical storage unit. So that means your data is going to be st stored in this sector. Even though you have track, you have cylinder, at the end of the sector is where you. So the sector size depends upon the artist, right? Based on that, how much data you want to store and what is the uh, size of it. So probably I can start with something like, you know, a, a 512 byte for HEKD. You know, you have something like uh, CD-ROM and DVD as, you know, 2K. Let us HEKD, which uses 4K byte sectors. That means it can store 4K as one sector, it's big, right? So the more, the bigger, the more data you can store and it can help you. Then you have something called each label with the factory track position data. The optimum method of storing file on a disk is continuous series. You need to keep it and continuous, not to have random because then you'll have space, empty space in between. Right? So if you have a size of 60 bytes, so what happened, it will become two 512 bytes. So how it is going to be stored? Let me give an example. So it is going to be like this, right? 512 and 512. So 600 bytes, what I'm going to do, 
I'm going to fill that the first five twelve into this, the sector one. Okay, I'm going to fill up the first one. Sorry, one second. First one is going to be like this. The second one, so five twelve. So if we if we subtract from six hundred five twelve, how much is now remaining? It's almost. 88 bytes. Is that right? 88 plus 512 is you'll have 600. So now you have a data of 600 bytes. So remaining 88 will be stored here. So rest of them. So when you have another data, it will start from here. So it is how the data is stored. Is it clear? All of you? Are you able to understand? You're going step by step to make sure you are understanding how the data is stored. Please be interactive in the chat so that we understood that you are following it up. Yeah. Use the chat box, very good. So let us get into the next one. Next one. So sector addressing. So we talked about cylinders, head, and sectors is called CHS, right? Can you see this? This kind of a cylinders, right? So, so we're saying when a disk is formatted, is divided into tracks and sectors. We know that. So sector is a small one. You know, the track is the complete one, right? The track consists of multiple sectors. Very good. So for example, the format, the disk might be might, might contain 50 tracks. Each of them can be divided into 50. So how many sectors in, in this totally? Can anyone tell? Yeah. Not 512 into 12, 512 plus 88. Yeah? So 500, exactly 500 sectors. Yeah? Track and sector numbers are used by the OS and disk drive to identify the stored number. So disk drive is a program. But drive, anything that comes as a drive is a program, right? So the operating system want to know where is the data stored. So it has to know the track and sector number. So now you understand, if you deleted a file, the, the OS or you want to retrieve, the most important thing is you need to know the numbers, you know, track and sector numbers. Does it make sense for all of you? So let us get into that. So new hard disk, which is like 4K, I told you advanced format sector. So it's advanced format called 4K, you basically use the storage surface media. So you can use most of the things, right? So it can merge, 512 byte sectors into a single sector. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? So it becomes merged everything together and become one. So it is a ECC is a one, gap, sing, under mask, all of them. Yeah. So ECC is nothing but error correction coding. So if there is any error in the stored data, there will be error code. So it says there is a error, data error, maybe the disk is having error. So that's how it corrects the error. If you, you know, if something happened. Okay. So that is a error. Then the error also distributed into multiple locations so that it can be easily corrected. So this is the format of hard disk drive, hard disk drive with 4K sectors. So now let us understand you now, what are the things you understand? Can you type some of the names you understood now? Some of the main terminologies. Can you type in the chat box, please? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sectors, track, okay then. That's it. What about cylinder? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, very good. Head, it is the one it, it, it comes, yeah. So data is recorded on the artist using the method call. How it is stored? Zone with recording, also known as multiple zone recording. Okay, it, what happens, tracks are combined together into zones, depending upon their distance from the center of the disk. So you have center, so it says zone one, zone two, zone three, All right? It come, becomes a zone. So before that head moves from this location to another location, spin, so know that this is the one zone. So I can easily move the data across, All right? So it is defined as the space between the tracks, track density, aerial density, bits per square inch on the plate. 
bit density, bits per unit length at the track. So you don't have to bother about all of them, but I understand there is something called track density. Track, you know, means a couple of track together, together, it forms zone. That is something which you need to understand. So you understand what is zone? Zone is nothing but combination of, you know, tracks, right? Tracks are combined together into zones from the center of disk. So no problem, you can chat to me, you will not be able to see others. You, you have to chat only to me. I'm able to see Nazim. okay? You can chat. Okay. So now type of data density you understood now. So let us understand what is CHS, cylinder head sector. So it's something data addressing and disk capacity calculation. Somebody says, I have one terabyte data, right? 42 terabyte or 10 terabyte, whatever you call. How do they calculate the size? Did you ever, you know, wondered how do they calculate the capacity? Have you done this before? Yes or no? No, am I? Okay. So how do they calculate the disk capacity calculation? That disk drive has cylinders. That is something which is very important. And they have 80 heads, very huge. And 63 sectors per track, right? So the sector has 5 to 1. So what is the capacity of such disk? Now we are going to calculate. So we need to see number of cylinders, okay? So into 80, it means there are 80 readers, which is going to read, right? So how many sectors per track? 63 per track, and this is the byte. So overall, you get this almost 42, 278, 5, 82, 320 bytes, 42, almost trillion bytes. Yeah, that is the size of the hard disk. So you can imagine how they're calculating all of them with this uh, number of cylinders, heads, and they are coming up. This is your capacity of the hard disk. So we call CH, cylinder head sector. So how do you, so okay, I know the size capacity, but what is the performance? Means how quickly I can read, write, write data. That is also important, am I right? So you have a one terabyte of disk, but what if it is very slow? Do you accept that? Yeah. Do you accept that if it is yeah, one terabyte, but you know, it's very slow. So what is important? Yeah, not only storage capacity, it also to be very fast. Nowadays we want fast. So what is the hardest we are moving nowadays? For fast, we want high speed. What is the type of SGD? You are right, exactly. Flash, SGD, all of them are same. Okay, so we'll talk about that. So measuring the hard disk performance is nothing but data is stored on the hard disk in the form of files, right? So when you're running a program, request a, request a file, you're running a Microsoft Word, maybe PowerPoint. So what is going to happen? It is going to open a file. So the hard disk recovers the byte content of the file and sends the byte to the CPU. One at a time for further processing. It cannot send everything at the same time. It has to send one byte at the same time. That SCSI cable, do you remember? The cable which is connecting from the hard disk to the motherboard. So that is where the bytes are going to come. So data rate is the ratio of number of bytes per second that the hard disk sends to the CPU. That is the data rate. Yeah. Save time is that it is the amount of time required to send the first byte of the file to the CPU when it requests the file. For example, when I'm asking a file, how quick I can get the first byte? All right. The first byte, if, if, if I can set if we can take the first byte from the entire hard disk within 0 0.003 seconds, that means it's very quick. So once I get the first byte, rest of them will follow through, right? Then we call it as data rate. Is that clear all of you? What is the seek time and what is the data? Because this is something which you will use later on in your performance calculations. Yeah? Not seeing much chart. Is it clear? So then we have something called SGD, solid state drive. 
So solid state drive, other than you know, not different from HDD, is a non-volatile storage. The device is NAND flash memory. It's a flash memory. So it chips to store digital data. So it's not like cylinders. So you have multiple cylinders. You have so many cylinders, and then you have head. So it has to move. So you have limited with the performance. But when you talk about SDD, is it does it have a cylinder? Is it a cylinder? No. It is a flash memory. Am I right? One, two, three, four, five. Six, it's a flash memory, right? So it is it is main data storage unit. Then NAND memory is the storage. Then it has got a processor that acts as a bridge between the flash memory and the computer host by executing firmware level software. So this is the controller. So it is going to you know send between you know the the, the NAND memory to the where. Well, Not to the computer, right? Third one is DRAM. What is DRAM? This is a this is a volatile memory that provides faster read-write. So instead of you take all the data, it can be here, it can be rewrite, right? So it's a volatile. It's not non-volatile. It's another volatile memory. Then you have something called like you had other where other side you had something called um, SCSI. Here you have something called host interface. It could be different one like SATA. SATA we call PCI as SCSI example. Normally we, we call SATA, you know, as the interface, which is mainly used in SSD. So did you understand the difference between this? SDD is more reliable because it doesn't have any physical friction. Am I right? It doesn't have like a cylinder head. So those things can be easily, you know, get into problem, but SDD is more about volatile memories, am I right? And Memories. Is it clear? Uh, who asked Amar? Yeah. So SATA is the, I, I told you, this is the connection. SATA is nothing but a cable, interface cable. Like we had SCSI cable, which was connecting the hard disk, you know, to the motherboard. Same way here, SATA. PCS, CASI, anything can connect this, you know, SDD to the motherboard. Okay. Yeah, Saumia, is it clear? What is SATA? Very well. Okay. Fine. So let us get into. So this is how the SATA works. So normally that's why they prefer SDD over HDD. For this reason, because there is no movement, physical movement, no cylinder, no head, am I right? Here it's all about you know, non-volatile storage, flash memory chips, you know, multiple chips in one motherboard. That's it. Very good. So, what are the different type of interface? That's something which you asked. It's here. So, SATA is a kind of a normal pin advancement of ATA. So, ATA is advanced technology attachment. You know, somebody said IDE, yes, exactly. It is called integrated drive electronics, a standard interface between motherboard, data bus, and storage disk. So you have a motherboard and you have a data disk which has to connect. That is called IDE, integrated drive, drive electronics IDE. But the advanced one is called ATA. But now the advancement for SATA, we use, for, for HD, we use SATA because it's a serial attack. It's, it's also small pin, right? It's very easy to connect. It's not very bulky like this. Yeah, it's not very big. It is small, thin one. Yeah. Okay. Is it clear now? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. So most of them, they are saying clear. Could be your issues with the internet. Okay. So now you understood what is different type of hard disk connector. So let us go another one. This is called serial attached SCSI. It's called SAS, successor of advanced alternative to parallel because the SCSI is parallel, like one, two, three, four. So all the bits goes parallelly. 
whereas in, in serial, it goes bit by bit. Right? So SCSI is a small computer system interface, refers to ANSI standard based on parallel bus. Okay. Designed to connect multiple peripherals to the computer. That is what we use. So please understand these are the disk interfaces which you need to understand. It is not one type, it could be different type. Okay. Let us are you able to understand now? Describe different type of disk drives and their characters. What is HDD? What is SDD? What are type of cable you have? Is that clear? Please type yes before we get into the next one. Wonderful. So, because I want to take one by one, I think it's very basic things. Many of you might be knowing, but in order to understand forensic, you know, when somebody, something happened to the data, how to look, what, where to look. So this information, this knowledge is required. That's why I'm teaching those basic, basics. And towards that, we will have a lab where we'll analyze two tools, you know, where we are going to analyze the file system and also recover the deleted files. Okay? Good. So logical structure of disk, what we are going to have. So logically the hard disk is the file system and software placed to control access to the storage on the disk. So hard disk logical structure has significant influence like performance, extendability, compatibility. So different OS have different file system using various methods arranging and controlling access to the data. So you remember we used to do partition and store data, am I right? C drive, D drive, all of them for different data. So what is cluster? Cluster is the smallest logical storage unit. We have multiple things. It's the smallest logical storage unit. The cluster number is 2 to 32 or more. All right. So disk volume, the file system divides the storage on disk volume into discrete chunks of data. All right. So this is how the data are stored. The process by which the files are allocated to the cluster is known called allocation. Therefore, cluster are also known as allocation unit. So you need to understand the cluster is the smallest logical storage unit. Right? So if the fat file system, the cluster linked with the file keep track of the file data, the hard disk file allocation table, we call it file allocation table, um, which is called fat file system. That's where we say this is the starting point of the file. So what is the cluster size? Cluster sizing as why do we need to have the cluster sizing? Because that is something that's going to impact the performance. If you remember, when you are going to uh, format a hard disk, it is going to ask you the cluster size, right? Because if you don't have a proper cluster size, it's going to impact the performance of the OS and disk utilization. But it can be opt, you know, altered for optimal disk storage. The file of the cluster depends on the size of the disk partition. So if you have one, terabyte, maybe 512 is MB, uh, you know, GB is one partition. Another one is uh, 256. Third one is 250. So if we say this is the C drive, this is the D drive, this is the E drive, right? One terabyte, you, you multi, you format it into different ways. The larger class size has the following effect. Minimize the fragmentation. So always make the large, increase the probability used space. Reduce the disk storage area, right? Reduce the unused area on the disk. These are the advantage of having a larger cluster size. So you need to understand. So if you have lost any cluster in your hard disk, it is going to tell when a voice mark a cluster as used, but does not allocate them to any file. So you have something called cluster. It is one, we said the logical unit. In the operating system, what says? Now I'm going to use, it is saying that this cluster number one, one zero one two or one one zero one, the OS is saying it's already used, am I right? But does not allocate them to any file, it is empty. OS is saying is used, you know, it marked as used but doesn't have any file. Such clusters are known as lost clusters. So you can do something called CHK disk, check your disk. 
just do that windows we share my another screen yeah so what i'm going to run now chk disk yeah chk disk i need to be uh, admin or to be locked by another process okay so anyway we will take it in lab in one then okay fine so what is going to happen when you run check disk it's going to tell what are the type of file size is it read only it examines and tell how many you know files recorded two files recorded processed zero bad file index entries all right then it's going to say use and byte processed how many files so it's giving you the complete information about that hard disk this call check disk we'll do one thing and we we'll change it to Okay. So this is the command used to check your disk. We'll talk about it later on. Okay, just understand this. We'll go to the lab. So check this is a tool in Windows that authenticates file system reliability, volume, and replies logical file system errors. If there is any error, it can reply. Then something called slack space. So it is a storage area of a disk between the end of file and the end of the cluster. We said the cluster is where you use, but slack space is between the end of a file and the end of a cluster. So it's have sector one, two. So each sector is five, 12 bytes. So this is where you have stored your file that, you know, um, Ibrahim dot, uh, you know, CV, let us say my CV dot uh, TXT is a file, but slack space filled by OS. And then you have slack space, right? This is the end of the cluster. So a cluster is going to be, we are saying, the cluster size is what? You know, 2K, right? Or it could be 4K, whatever it could be. Our clusters could be 4242, but the size could, could be 2K is the cluster size. So 2K means I'm going to have one, two, three, four, five, 12 bytes. It forms 2K. 2048 bytes. And it's going to tell what is the cluster ID. This is the cluster ID. So just understand slack space is something which is the empty one. For example, if the partition size is 4 GB, each cluster will be 32 KB in size. Even if a file requires only 10 KB, the entire 32 KB will be allocated to the file, resulting what is going to happen. The 22 KB is a slack space or the space which is not going to be used. Because your file size is small, but your cluster size is 32 KB. Right? So that means the 22 KB is not going to be used. Something which you need to understand. So do a little bit of mathematics, you will understand. Okay, now let us get into another one, another important concept is called master boot records. Fine. What is called master? Good record. We'll just quickly run through that, then we will get into some of the. Just to hold on. Okay. So let us do one thing. Let us have a fifteen minutes break because I know that it is going to take some more time. Okay. So let us understand what is MBR, Master Boost Record. Okay. It is the first sector, you know, we call it a sector zero of a data storage device, such as a hard disk. So in hard disk, the first sector, am I right? The one we talked about, sector is small, then you have a track, am I right? 
it is the minimum value where you store the data in sector, in a small bag. So sector is there. The first sector is called MDR, master boot record. Right? That is very, very important. So the information regarding the files on the disk and their location, size, other important data is stored in the MDR file. So in sector zero, you know, the sector zero is where it stores all the information about the files in the disk. For example, the, you have multiple files. For example, you have hundreds of files in your hard disk. So it will tell you, for example, this file is stored in which sector or which location. You know, what is the size? What is the important, other important data related to the particular file are stored in the MBR. So MBR is almost always referred as a boot sector. It is where it is a boot sector, partition sector. So it is used for the following, holding the partition table. For example, you have C partition, D, E, right? You can do it multiple partition of a hard disk. So it, it holds the partition table. And where do you want to bootstrap? Bootstrap is how do you start the operating system? So that the operating system starting point should also be stored in the MDR. Uh -huh. Then distinctively recognizing individual hard disk media with 32 bit signature, disk signature. So it can also recognize the hard disk media with 32 bit disk signature. So these are the things because sometimes you may be booting from the external hard disk, maybe you are booting from the uh, CD ROM, DVD ROM, you know, plus all of them. So MBR is something which is the main thing in any hard disk. Okay. So this is the structure of MBR, master boot code or bootstrap. It is in a, so whenever you install an operating system, so there is an executable code that is responsible for loading the OS into the memory, computer memory. So it structure comes of four, four, six bytes. So it's called bootstrap. If you are running a Windows, then Windows will have a bootstrap, which is stored in the master boot record, right? Then it has got a partition table, which is 64 bytes, which will talk about how many partition you have, like C drive, D drive, E drive, right? Multiple partition, 64 bytes. Then you have something called signature, which is a two, two byte. Right. It is required for BIOS during booting. So I hope you understand now 446 plus 64 plus 2. Right. So it's coming around how much? 512. Is that right? Yeah, 512 bytes. That's what we said there. The MBR size, master boot record size. So it's 440, which is the code area where your execution, then you have this signature optional four bit, four bytes, and then usually nulls, zero. Then this is all related to the master boot code, bootstrap. So you have 446, all right? Then you have, these are all optional anyway. When you have table of primary partition, like 16 byte you know, 64 byte, then you have signature, which is a two byte. So it's all of them together, it's 512. Is it clear? You can type yes, no in the chat box. Understanding MBR is very important for data recovery. Okay? Yeah? Okay. So this partition is something where you have primary partition, the extended partition, right? It's where you store the OS system area, right? Like we call it a C. The extended one is like D, E, all of them what we call. So creation of logical division of the OS specific logical format. Maybe you have C, in Windows D, you can have, for example, if you are running multiple system, another operating system you want to boot, you can do that. External hard disk, you can do that. Right. So BIOS parameters block is a data structure of the partition boot sector. So it defines the file system structure. It locates the file table. So it says that sector offset, BPP offset, field length, then what is the description? Serial number, volume number. It is for fact. 
22. In DFS, the BPP, BIOS parameter block, it is 73 byte. It has got different things, sector offset, right? What is the fill length? So what is the description? So say sector in volume, you know, MFT record size, index block size, you know, checksum. So you don't have to go through much, but understand there is something called BPD. Right? Then you also have something called the globally unique identifier. It is nothing but a 124-8 bit unique reference number used as an identifier in computer software. So generally, GUID or UID is a unique identifier. G means global. Right? This place is 32 hexadecimal digit, the groups of separated hyphens. So this is what you find it here. GUIDs. You click on that, you will find it. So common use, it is used for Windows registry to identify the common and object model or DLN. Right, com on DLL files in Windows. In database table GID used for primary key values. Right? In some instances, website may use GID to, to use as browser to record and track the session. You want to track how many sessions the user are accessing. Windows assign GID to user name to unique identify user accounts. So there are the different, you know, common use cases for global unique identifier. GUID. Okay. So we can go in deep. I am not going to talk about much about the advantage of G GPT disk. We call it uses a partition system known as GUID partition disk, which replaces the traditional MBR. So the new type is called GPT. So what is the advantage instead of using MBR? The GPT, it supports 128 partitions and uses 64-bit logical block address. So it maximum partition size ranging from two debibytes to eight zebibytes provides primary and backup partition protection. So if one goes down, the other one can also help you. So these are the advantage of GPT, global NIC identifier partition table. So just you keep it in memory, but don't confuse, you don't understand, it's fine, but understand there is MBR and what is the other one called? Can all of you type MPR or GPT? GUID partition table. Can you type both of them in the chat box? Please. MPR is a must boost and a partition table, partition record, must boot record, and GPT is global unique ID. Partition table, GPT. Okay, these are the two things which is very important. So now let us understand how the boot system, when the windows loads, how does it work? So I'll talk about windows. So it learns the starting and restarting OS, loads the OS, stored an hard disk into the RAM working memory, right? We call it cold boot, which is hard boot. Warm read, cold boot means power down. Warm boot means, you know, you turn on, you know, by restarting the computer, right? It's available, you say a restart. It is called warm boot, soft boot, we call it. Both of them, it loads. So how does it work? What are the files required for working? It's called NTOS kernel, executive and kernel. NT kernel and PA, which is called physical address extension. Hardware abstraction layer. Kernel mode part of Windows 32, Windows Win 32K, NTDLL. Internal support function. And these are all files which are related to the DLL files. Kernel, adapter, user, all of that. So these are the essential Windows file system, which we need to understand for Windows to work. So how does it work? So it's from BIOS, it goes to MBR, then it's going to VBR, then ND boot sector, and boot manager, and it's sort of window load XE, and it goes to resume and basically boot configuration data. Then from here it comes, Again, NT OS kernel, uh, NT all the file system we have, we, have, we have seen before, it start loading one by one. So Windows XP window, all of them starts using traditional BIOS MBR. You know, Windows 8 and above uses traditional BIOS MBR method or newer, you know, GPT method. Right? This is how it boots. So identifying the MBR partition, so you can go to the storage, this partition, go to the property, you will find, Partition table is MBR, master boot record. 
Okay, that's how we can find. Windows boot process for GPT is different. Sec, PEI, DXE, BDA, it's called uh, UEFI phase, and then you go to transfer control OS phase. So you don't have to get into too much, but understand this is a different boot process. So you want to find out the GPT, go and check, get GPT path, physical address, it will revision where it is located. If it is a master boot record, you know, it will throw an error prompting to get, use get MBR instead, all right? So it's alternative, but open computer management application, click disk management. So you can find out what is this, you know, GPT table where it is located, like MBR. You don't have to look into too much, but let us get into that. So it is called get partition table. Just skipping, but it's not that much important. So most OS that support GPT disk access provide a basic partition tool and which displays detail about GPT. So we understood GPT is a partition table, right? So why do we need to understand this GPT? So you might be saying, why do we need to learn all these things? Right? First of all, if we delete or overwrite GUID partition, case one, if the MBR disk is repartition or converted to GPT, then sector zero will generally overwritten with productive MBR. Okay. To recover data from previously MBR partition balance, investigator can use standard forensic in a method used to perform extensive search for file system. Here's the case one. Okay, we are deleted. We can use that MBR to recover. Second one, case two. If the GPT disk is repartitioned with convert to the MBR, then GPT header and tables may remain intact based on the tool used. Okay. So GPT disk might only delete the previous productive MBR, which can be recreated by simply reconstructing the disk. So this is how they can recover. So deleted and overwritten partition. Second one, GOID identity, identifier. GPT scheme provides GOID of investigative value as they are unique and hold potential useful information within them. So you need to understand that GOID identifier. The third one is hidden information in the disk. So individual may hide data and GPT disk as they do it with the traditional MBR disk. So may they hide that this is hidden files or hidden data. So if we know the file system architecture, then you can use, you can you, you can will be able to easily, you know, unhide and understand the files. So current forensic method and tools to perform GPT analysis are unsatisfactory, but we can use some of the advanced tool in our electronics classes. Okay, let us now understand the Mac boot process. We don't want to go into that. Mac use a different way, way like boot code, voice code, or application driver, but don't bother about it, but understand Mac uses a different method. Linux, it uses again different method. We call something called BIOS runs post, which is to check all the hardware, whether it is power on self-test is called post. Right, on successful test, it goes to MBR, then it goes to the bootloader, then it loads the kernel, kernel amount, different file systems. It runs the file system and load the demon. Demon is nothing but the process. All right. So these are the different process in next boot process. So we are coming to the next one. I'm just skipping some of them because it may not be interesting to you. Let us get into the lab so it will be easy to understand. So let us get into understanding various file system windows. What are the different file systems? Okay. Windows file system, there are two one. One is called FAT, and we have something called FAT 12, 16, and 32. So FAT is nothing but file allocation table. File allocation table. So it is used in mainly DOS and the previous voice system. So FAT resides at the beginning of the volume. 
So you have like 12, 16, 32. Size of the entries in the fat system structure differs based on the system. Fat is 1.5 bytes per cluster. Fat 16 is 2. Fat 32 is 4 bytes per cluster within file allocation. Right? So it can, the cluster limit, it can go up to 65,000 to a you know, higher version. So directory in the system, file one, byte, cluster 32, the clusters in a combination of different cluster, and fat structure says end of file. So this is the directory entry structure of fat 32. But right now, we are using not fat, most of the system use NTFS, new technology file system. It's a standard file system in Windows ND and also all the servers. So it uses NTFS. There are several improvements over FAT because it supports something called metadata and uses of advanced data structure to improve the performance, reliability, and synthesis space utilization. So NDFS is something advanced one. So you just understand that, right? So you have something called kernel mode and user mode. I'm not going to go into that. So file names, different file names, okay, uh, attribute, you know, bad clusters, bitmap, volume bootstrap. Recovery purpose, log files, all of them are used. The third one is called encrypted file system. Okay. The encrypted file system is something which was introduced in version three, where it used encryption technology to maintain level of transparency to the user. Right? So after user is done with the file, the encryption policy is automatically restored. Right? So it is like protecting the file. They are if, you, if there is an unauthorized user try to access the encrypted file, it will deny the access. The best example is you have like BitLogger to encrypt the file, right? So EFS itself is a file system. File encrypted key, data encryption field, and recovery fields, and encrypted data. So now you understand there are three file system, FAT, and then NTFS and EFS, okay? So there is also the next file system. The next file system is called, you know, user application, inode cache, virtual file system, individual file system, buffer cache, and device. So there is something called user and something on the kernel. Kernel is where everything is run, right? So we call it something like bin, which is used binaries. Boot is where bootloader is there, kernel, etc. Device is where device files like device. ETC is where system configuration file. Home is related to user files. Library is for binaries. Media is where mounts the removable media, right? And then your root is where the home directory for the root user. And proc is the virtual file system. Run is where you run all the processes. Bin is where the binary files are stored. Temporary files are stored in temp. You know, var is where logs and spool files are stored. So if you want to understand window, you know, Linux, it is called file system hierarchy standard, FSH. File system hierarchy standard, it is in a hierarchy standard, right? So directories are present under the root with this symbol, right? Bin, boot, all of it. So this is called Linux system, right? And also you have something called extended file system. It's the first file system of the Linux voice to overcome certain limitation of the Minix file system. Then they had something called, it is replaced with the exe2, then they, you know, it has a maximum number of two GB. It removes two major Minix file system, a maximum partition size of 64 MB. Right? The major limitation of the file system is that does not support separate access. So they come up with something called exe2. So that is for Linux file system, right? exe and exe2. exe2 is a, a group of files, right? Then they had something called exe3, third you know, extended file system, which is used now. Right? So then also something called journaling the file. Journaling file system into data integrity of a computer. So journaling prevents any data corruption, like exe3, zfs, XFS are some of the example of journaling file system in Linux. Okay? Then they also add ext4, something advanced first, replacing the exe3. I'm not going to go into that. Let us get into Mac. Mac has a different something called UFS, HSF, 
and also it has Apple file system, APFS. This is the file system in Mac. Okay. Hierarchical file system. I'm not Apple file system as Apple file system and consider two layer, one is container layer and file system layer. Just understand. So let us come to the last one, which is examining the file. Then we are going to get to the lab. Fine. I'm sorry to take this theory because um, you know, I know it may be looking boring, but at the end of the day, you need to understand the file system if you want to later on recover data. Okay, so let us finish this file system and get to the lab. So, what is the tool I'm going to use? Few slides only. The first slide is first tool is called AutoSpy. Okay. So what is AutoSpy? It is a digital forensic platform and graphic interface to the stealth tool and other digital forensic tools we are going to use. It can be investigative activities used for in, 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 investigative activities on the computer. So you need to, first of all, go install AutoSpy in your system, right? Then you can extract the file, you know, you can find out what are the file properties, all of them into the system. So what is file system analysis using Sleuth tool, TSK, the Sleuth tool? It's a library and collection of common line tools allows the investigation of volume and file system data. That is the first thing. Second one, it examines the file system of a suspect computer in drawn entry situation. So if you think that some computer in a file system has been corrupted, then you can find out whether it is a, you can do some kind of a investigation. So it can support DOS, BST, Mac, GPT, etc. And also it analyzes the raw and also expert witness and AFF file system disk imaging. So it can support different type of all the different type of file system, NDFS, PAD, TXT, one, two, three, four, all of them. So it is mainly to analyze a file. So how do you recover a deleted file from a hard disk? That is something which is very important, right? We use tool called BinX. So it's a hexadecimal editor used for computer forensic data recovery and low level data processing and IT security. So it mainly used to inspect and edit all type of files and recover deleted files or lost data from the hard drive. With corrupt file system or from memory cards of digital cameras. It's very, very important. So if you have this bin X tools, it can recover the deleted files. Okay, are you able to understand? Next. So let us get into the lab. Before that, let me summarize. So we talked about Soro, different type of storage drives. And we talked about logical structure of the disk. We talked about how the system boots in Windows, Linux, Mac. We talked about different file system in Windows, Linux, and Mac. We also talked about how to examine the file system using AutoSP and TSK. Uh, that's something which is very, very modern. So next module we'll talk about duplication tools. Okay, so can we get into the labs? Are you ready? Yes. So you see two labs today. I'm not seeing any comments. Are you ready for that? Chat box, yeah. So it's going to be 10, maximum 10 to 15 minutes. Let us see. Trying to download that. This is the myth. I'm just trying to change the tab and then we'll start it.
So we are going to analyze the file, then we are going to recover the file, okay? Let me start with the lab. Yeah, we are going to do, go to the autos file. Okay, so understanding the hard file, we saw that. So what I'm going to do now, so I analyze the file system of Linux image file, and also we are going to recover files from a deleted hard disk. Okay, that's what we'll be doing in this lab. So let us say you have, uh, you, you know, one of your company employee, you know, was gathering crucial conference information of the company and saving in his computer, right? So when you want to check in, in, the, in the employee's computer, uh, what he, he did, he, the culprit employee permanently deleted the gathered information. So now you want to prove that this guy was collecting confidential information within the company. How can you prove? Can I prove you after he deletes the file? Screen is visible now? All of you? Yes or no? The lab screen. Yeah? Okay, great. So you understood how can I recover a data when I when I want to go and catch this guy that he was doing some you know um, activities which is not uh, good for the company because he, he took all the conference information, but I, when I tried to catch, he deleted it. So I don't have proof. So can I recover that file? So I want to use a cyber forensic investigator. I'm calling him, please come, you know, help me. Okay, this is what he's going to do. I'm analyzing the file system and he'll recover the deleted files to catch the, the dishonest employee. Is it interesting? You're now going to catch that culprit. Yeah, is it interesting for all of you? The, the use case? Okay, let us see how he's going to do. So I'm going to analyze the file. So let me do the analyzing the file system in the next image. File system type, what is the metadata, content information, that is what I'm going to check it. Let me log into the lab. This is my Windows lab, logging in. So logged in, I'm going to refresh, okay. I'm going to run the tool called AutoSpy, AutoSpy, am I right? Open extensible past, okay. I'm going to create a new case. Let's say case information. Okay, let me put some name. Linux, yeah. Linux analysis. I'm going to do that. Linux file analysis, all right. So I'm just getting into the desktop image file analysis, creating where I want to store, just mentioning that. Yeah. So optional information, you want a case number, you can create a case like 1001, just to like, you know, you're logging this case number in the table. So you know that which case, when it was used. Name John, number, okay. So it's creating a case. Okay. Okay, now, sorry. Now I've created, add a data source. I'm doing that. Select type of data source to add and select a data stores, which source you want to select, right? Browse. I want to analyze, let us say, my computer PC, because I'm analyzing a file and I'm going to then recover. So I'm selected and I'm going to choose uh, local disk C. 
Okay. And local register, I'm going to use something called uh, examine files. I want to examine a particular file. Okay. Forensic images. I'm just, this is the image I'm trying to examine. The next evidence one image. So this is the path. Great. So MD5. Okay. Next. Configure ingest model. Okay, I'm just selecting the default one. Sorry, Let me go back. Yeah, recent activity, all of them are selected. Okay. Now add data source is done. Data source added. Click to view the log. So let me view the logs. I'm analyzing a file. I want to analyze the file type. Right. So this is the image I analyzed. Okay. Data source is this. Okay. Very good. Yeah. We examine all the record file image as part of the system. This lab, we're going to view the password file that is stored. Okay. So in, in within that, something all in the image, there is also, let me go inside. Table sambar. So I'm going inside that particular image. Okay. I'm trying to search password. So I'm searching my password. I'm seeing the text. We will receive the metadata. Okay. Now let us go and say, so when we click on metadata analysis to read that. So this I'm just analyzing the file, file, what is there inside. So you analyze the other once again. This way, what we are trying to do is we are analyzing all the files and folders so we can get more information of the file. What is the string? What is metadata? What it contains, it can go in detail. All right. So apart from that, it can also vary in the integrity of the evidence. In this lab, we will be calculating the MD5 hash of the file name seed plant of the Excel, which is located in document. So I want to see whether the file is integrity is maintained. The MD5, you know, is same or not. Now we are just loading a file and analyzing what the file type is. That is the objective. Then we will recover. Sadia, is, is it clear? We are just loading because. Normally, if you load a file, you will not be able to understand what this file is all about. Name is different. You don't know what it is. So if the file is changed or not, particular file is changed or not, that we can use through MD5 as. Last session, we saw that. You remember. So let us do that. You see plan. So let us go to file. I want to load another file. Boom. So this is the evidence.image is which I captured from the hard disk. Okay. Go to the file, seed plan. So it's like an image of the particular hard disk, Linux evidence. So image. So I'm seeing the MD5. Yeah, MD5 has been able to see the MD5. Yeah. So now file metadata displays folders. So I'm able to see that access times followed by its MD5 value. Okay. So it's well artifact ID and it shows the file is password printer. Okay. Let us check it now. So password protected detected. This file is see, we are now imagine you are scanning a particular hard disk. Next evidence is image is the hard disk. We took the image and trying to see each and everything now. I'm trying to image. Okay, I'm checking the image. What is that? Image video gallery. It was hidden in, inside. Content EFS. Okay, so now, so now we just analyze a file. So you had a hard disk image. 
which you recovered from uh, you know the culprit PC. Now you are able to get in and analyze what are the different files inside because it was the image, but you loaded the image and you are able to analyze. Imagine, okay, the image is a Linux image, right? You are able to see what is inside now with the auto spy. So now I want to recover the deleted files. That is what I am going. To do. So the first one, what we did, we just loaded an image of a hard disk and able to navigate each and every files in the hard disk. Is it clear the objective? All of you, what we did, because knowing through going through the different files itself a great thing. Am I right? Because you recovered hard disk, you are able to now go inside file system, right? meta information, content information. That is the first exercise. Did you all of you understood? Otherwise, you have to load with the you know different uh, window system. You need to understand. But now you don't have anything, just the entire image you are able to see that. Yeah, so you're not asking about the sector or something. Here, yeah, boot sector, everything is there. You took an image of a particular hard disk and loaded with auto speed and able to see what is inside. That is something which is you are doing. Yeah, yeah, obviously the sector is not overwritten. Nobody will go and delete the MDR. Okay, Sayed. Is it clear for everyone? I want to see more as. Yeah, fine, good. So now, so the objective of the lab is nothing but to file system, how to look at it. Now I'm going to show you another lab, which is to recover the file. You deleted something, I'm going to recover. Okay. Yeah, obviously, you know the who is the culprit because that is what you are suspecting, am I right? As a manager, you are suspecting. So you went and took the artist and you are analyzing. Yes, exactly. Nazir, you are right. We know who is the culprit. We took the hard disk and loaded the image. Because we saw the narrative that he was suspecting that particular person. So now let us go to the next one. Recovering the deleted files. So um, it's very simple. So, so now start scanning the computer for deleted files. So the guy has, you know, collected the company's private data. Right? So to avoid identification, the perpetrator also deleted the files. But however, as an investigator, we are able to trace the system used by the perpetrator to analyze the file system. Recovering deleted data using the bin X tool. This is something very, very important. Is that right? I'm going to use now bin X tool. First, I analyzed, now I'm going to recover. Did you understand this objective? The objective is to help you understand how to recover files that have been permanently deleted using the by the guy, but we are going to use bin X tool to recover it. Okay, is it clear? So we start. So first of all, you need to load the image, then only you can recover. All right. So make sure the real time protection is disabled in Windows 10 before beginning the lab because if your real time protection is there, it may not allow you to see the file. Okay. So let us get into that now. Lab task. Okay. We enable real time product disabled. So I'll go. I'll first get into that. Yeah. Program model three file system analysis tool, pin X. I'm going to install the tool. Then install setup.exe. Yeah. Pin X. Yeah. So Win X is running now. I'm going to open and open. Go to the computer, C colon, PFE tools, evidence file. This is the image I took it. So I go to the image, forensic image, images, Linux evidence. I'm loading this image file. Okay. 
I mean, okay. So now it's giving you the entire image of a hard disk. Okay. Data interpreter enable now. So let me go to option tool, this tool, file recovery by time. Okay, okay, let me do that. So what do you want to recover? You want to recover pictures. You know? So what are the different type of picture you want to do? You can click on it, different type of thing. Okay. Output, but where do you want to put that images? Right, if it discovered. So you can have a path where you can store. So desktop, create a new file. Yeah. Retrieved files. Okay. I created a file. So all these pictures I want to. Any pictures which has been deleted, I want to recover. Okay, now I'm running the tool. So these are the deleted files of, so it's running like 4 GB, 3.5 files, so many files, so many files. So letters were found, files were retrieved, 500 files. Oh my God. So I run the tool. Now you go to the files, retrieved files. Wow. This many image you have it. So these are the deleted files which has been recovered by bin X2. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, it's, there is no day limit because it's there in the hard disk. As long as nobody formatted fully, then you can delete. So this is the second lab. We can use bin X tool to recover the data, even if you have it in the memory. How it's recovered is running the tool. It goes to the master boot record. It checks what are the volumes it has stored because most of the deleted file not permanently deleted. It will be there. So it is using the tool to run and recover the data. Fine. That's what we are seeing in the previous slides. Yeah, you need to, you can download. We'll give it you know, towards the end, you know, but you can also search in the Google, you will find it. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? So please leave your feedback. Most of the time, whoever is giving feedback, other things will be sharing, marking you, and giving you some kind of uh, you know tools and uh, other things will be shared with you. So try to write today's feedback. I think it's some of the things are boring because it's about file system. But I hope you understood what is MBR, what are the different type of file system, how does it put, where does it this data store, you know, how the file structure, you know, work, what is SSD and HDD. These are very, very important things. So where do you get the, the notes and PDFs? So we have it, we, we will share it in the group, the entire PDF. Okay, Praveen? Yeah. Yeah, if they use some paid wiping and shredding software, it will be difficult, but we, we have different things to you know do it. First, at least start with that. When you go advanced forensic, you will learn how to do it. Yeah, WhatsApp group, it is there. We'll do it in the group link, you can download it. But but please leave your feedback. Yeah, so that you would be able to get some advanced gift. I, your feedback, feedbacks are very important. Especially, please, all of you are following in LinkedIn? Are you following in LinkedIn? Yes or no? Please follow me on LinkedIn. Join the LinkedIn profile so that whenever we share anything, you'll be able to see that. Good. OK, thank you very much. I hope to see you next week and we will also share you the documents and also please, uh, you know, leave your feedback. See, the practical, we will give you the videos. You can, you can, you know, watch it again. 
it, it, it's, it's mainly because it's only three minutes. We are just running the tool. So we will give you the tool, try to run yourself and try to see if you can recover some of the as we progress. Okay, Fajit. Yeah. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Fajit. Take care. See you next week.